Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to Wednesday morning's breakfast online seminar. Today we are joined by Connor Ahern, consultant to the CFL Trade Rush, with the latest in his QS series, which will be covering payment security. Um, as always, please feel free to ask Connor any questions, but if you could pop them into the chat and question facility in the bottom toolbar, and he will address those at the end of his presentation. And if there's something you don't wish to speak about in an open forum, please feel free to email him. His details, details will be up shortly, but it's Connor Ahern at silverllp.com. And that's Connor with one in, uh, as I keep forgetting. Right, Connor, it's up to you now. Off you go. Okay, thanks, Julie. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, you're all very welcome to yeah the latest in what we call the QS series. Uh, we're going to look at payment security um, yeah very important topic um, at the moment uh, it's just uh, it's, it's a bit of a hot topic because obviously of the of the um, of the pandemic and what we're noticing is that a lot of clients um, are seeking additional um, security um, from their you know from their contractors and vice versa also so we're going to look at the different uh, security mechanisms that are available to both uh, contractors and employers. Um, so yeah, so we'll look, we'll get, we'll get straight into it. Um, there's, that's me, that's my profile. Uh, yeah, just a bit of housekeeping, you know, as Julie said, um, if you do get any questions, um, if you pop them in the chat box, we'll, we'll pick them up at the end. I think the seminar is gonna be about 40, 45 minutes. Uh, so which will leave us a good, uh, you know, a good time at the end. Uh, to pick up any questions that you may have. Okay. Okay, so why do we need security? Um, basically, security, the main, the main reason we need security is because we're looking to protect ourselves in the event of an insolvency. That's pretty much it. Um, that takes priority over, over everything else. Um, in the contract because you know from a, from a contractor's point of view if he's not going to get paid there's no real point in doing the contract um, and if, similarly for the employer if he if the contractor is is going to become insolvent on the project that's going to create a lot of problems for him later on that he'd rather just uh, avoid and go with a a, a good contractor uh, right from the outset so obviously this is a conversation that needs to be had at the beginning of the contract um, a contract formation stage um, it's very very much part of uh, of our of the due diligence process um, involved in assessing the risk uh, of, of 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 the parties involved in in that in that contract i've made a note of poor payment history we'll come on to some of the you know some of the key uh, tr indicators to look out for uh, later on to decide, you know, what level of protection do I need? And ultimately, you know, what security do I need also? Um, in relation to the terminology today, uh, payment security, I've titled this seminar payment security. Now payment security is the form of security given by the employer to the contractor, because that's security for payments, uh, which obviously the contractor is most concerned about. Um, Later on, we will look at performance security also. Um, and this performance security flows from the contractor to the employer. Uh, these are basically the tools available to an employer uh, that, he, that he can obtain from the, his contractor in order to ensure performance. Um, so the distinction between the payment and performance security is an important one. And I mean, it follows that you know a construction contract at its most at its most basic level um, is essentially an employer's a an employer wants performance as part of a as part of his project, and the contractor wants to be paid. I mean, if it, when you boil it down to its real uh, to the very basics about what a construction contract is, that 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 is its essence. Um, so we're going to start by looking at some perform payment security options, and, and as I said, we look at some um, some performance security uh, later on. Okay, so first up in the uh, payment security option is the advance payment. Now, 
This is early payment, which is repayable at the end of the contract, which is usually based upon a cash flow forecast. Um, it's, it's useful for private clients or entities who have no uh, trading history. Um, I used to work in, as, as a QS in the residential, I guess the high-end residential basement market here in, in, in London. Um, and obviously on, on projects like that where you have uh, pretty wealthy clients who want to have a basement, usually with swimming, swimming pool, sauna, steam room, uh, the works. Um, obviously, as part of the due diligence in, the, in that process, um, it's quite difficult for clients like that to, I mean, they, they basically won't have a trading history. So what you're looking for is uh, what, one of the very common uh, method to basically mitigate our risk as a contractor was to uh, secure an advance payment. And yeah, that was basically to cover, cover work in progress and, and, and protect the contractor against the negative effects of perhaps the client running out, uh, running out of money. Uh, so usually um, in those circumstances, we were looking at an advance payment and obviously proof of funds for certainly our, uh, our element that it works, but ideally for the project as a whole. Uh, the principle is that the advance payment covers the work in progress throughout the contract. And that way, <coughs> excuse me, that way if funds are discontinued, the contractor's exposure is minimized through the advance payment. Uh, the contract should be clear as to what the purpose of the advance payment is intended to cover. Um, is the advance payment conditional upon performance or is it security for, for performance itself? Now, from a client's point of view, you would want the, uh, the advance payment to be conditional upon performance. I mean, the, the basis of the, you know, you're not buying the secure, you're not buying the performance uh, or trying to secure the contract with that particular contractor. It's basically to ensure performance is uh, carried out. I mean, sometimes it can even, uh, the advance payment can just be purely an aid to the contractor's cash flow as well. Um, so yeah, from, from, so from a, a client's point of view, it, it must be, you want to be saying that the advance payment is obviously conditional upon performance. Um, that was discussed in the case of Cadigan Petroleum Holdings versus uh, Global Process Systems. Um, so that's basically, you know, what you know what an advance payment is. Um, most of the time, uh, the payment, the, I guess, the repayment uh, of the advance payment comes about through the either the the, the final payment or the, the final two payments. Uh, that was that's usually the way it's done. Just uh, that's how the um, basically how you balance the books, um, because at that point, uh, really, the contractor's exposure. Uh, is relatively minimized. Obviously, again, depending on the circumstances, obviously, if he's got a, a significant difference in his final account against what he's actually been paid, um, you know, these are the kind of hurdles that you have to pre preempt at the time of contract um, and decide what's the best way uh, for the advance payment uh, to be repaid or to be included as part of the uh, final payment itself. So yeah, so look, that's advanced payment. That's one way that that uh, that an employer can um you know can give the contractor comfort uh, as to uh, the funding available uh, to to um uh, to complete the contract and obviously security for payment also. So next up is an escrow account. So what is an escrow account? We hear a lot about them, but. Um, it's, so what it is is a bank account where sums are held, which the contractor is entitled to in the in the event of a breach, uh, which is usually for non-payment. Um, the employer deposits a pre-agreed sum and agrees the uh, release procedure in the escrow agreement itself. Uh, the escrow sum is based on a cash flow projection, which will have, which will have been issued uh, by the contractor, and the escrow agreement is a tripartite agreement between the employer contractor and the escrow agent, which is usually the employer's solicitors. So, I mean, that's that's it at, at its most basic level. Um, the escrow is basically an account where surplus sums are held, uh, which must be pre-agreed uh, based on the anticipated level of exposure for the contractor. Um, those sums are held in, in, the, in the account uh, they should. Uh, you need to agree the release mechanism. So really, that 
those sums could not be just taken by the employer and removed uh, without the without any say by the contractor. Uh, that's obviously very important because you know it's fine having a sum in a in a in a bank account, but um, if the employer can basically remove that without notice, it doesn't really give the contractor the comfort that they're looking for. Um, yeah, so and, and the trigger events, I mean, you know, there could be there can be multiple trigger events as to why the escrow account would be needed, but obviously uh, the most important one is um, is a non-payment by the employer of either an, of, of either an interim uh, payment or of, or it can also cover the you know the final payment as well. Um, escrow accounts, they they are. I mean, I've come across them more um, in the last six months than I had in in the I don't know twelve fifteen years previous. I mean, they seem to be. Uh, quite popular um, at the moment because again, it, again, sec security is um, is at the forefront of people's minds, um, and yeah, that like they're basically tripartite agreements, um, and and again, it's just it, it, you've got to be very careful with the wording to make sure that it's giving you the level of comfort. And really, um, if you're to if you're to consider. Uh, consider the wording around uh, how you know how the payments are released or what the release mechanism for any money under the escrow account um, is to be carried out. That's the real. That, I mean, that's the crux of what you what you what you need to watch out for uh, when you are dealing with escrow accounts. Okay, uh, so the contractor takes comfort from the employer's ability to deposit the escrow sum. That is true. Uh, if the employer refuses to make a payment, then the contractor can call the escrow agent to release the sum. Uh, the set of costs and ongoing administration costs are usually borne by the employer. Um, yeah, it's true. It's true that the contractor will take comfort from the employer's ability to deposit the sum. Um, that's good, but again, just uh, consider it, it does, the, the release mechanism is, is, is crucial because uh, it's fair enough him having money in a, in a bank account but if he can take that money out at any time and treat it as his own like any other account well then you know the escrow you know it, it's an escrow um by name only and and it doesn't operate to give the uh to give the contractor the comfort that they're looking for um and the escrow agent is a very important um that's a very important role as well that's basically a nomin a, par a party nominated by the employer um and that's the party who the contractor must give notice to in the event of that breach uh, for non-payment and their duties and obligations under the escrow um, agreement uh, must be clear as to what they have to do in the event uh, once they receive the notice from the contractor. Okay, so next up is a uh, project bank accounts. Uh, so the primary purpose is uh, to protect the supply chain itself. Uh, when you're dealing with a project bank account, uh, there, again, there needs to be an agreed minimum level in the account at all times. Really what that needs to be is uh, a couple of months work in progress. So again, it depends on, depends on the cash flow, um, which, you know, needs to be agreed at the outset based on, uh, you know, program and agreed sums with the various trade contractors. Uh, it operates by as by the employer depositing sums in, into the, the project bank accounts, uh, which is paid to the contractors, subcontractors, and suppliers as necessary, um, and this must be in a, in addition to the minimum to the minimum level. The minimum level being the minimum amount um, agreed uh, under the PBA, and the under this model, the employer has separate contracts with the supply chain, so almost akin to um. Con, uh, con, construction management type approach. Um, project bank accounts, they, there's a lot of talk about them, um, particularly post Carillion. Um, project bank accounts were seen as one of the uh, one of the ways in which to avoid, uh, you know, Carillion like circumstances happening again, uh, because obviously, uh, you know, when Carillion became insolvent, there was uh, significant damage caused uh, at all levels of the supply chain, um, and PBAs were seen as a as a good way to um, avoid that risk in future. Um, my experience has been there's been a pretty low uptake 
Uh, I suspect a lot of that has been because there is a cost associated with the project bank accounts. Um, you know, usually <clears throat> based on whatever the sum deposited is, or even the um, or even what the contract sum is, uh, it can be a percent or two percent of that, which obviously on large schemes can be quite significant. So, I think that's the you know that that appears to be one of the big uh, reasons why uh, PBAs have been uh, aren't taken up as much as they possibly could. Which, but again, it's understandable because it's commercial dry, you know, we're in a commercial world, um, which employers and contractors are obviously part of, uh, that cost, you know, as I said, that cost can be significant for an employer, which um, at the end of the day is going to drive the decision as to what form of security it's going to be providing to its supply chain. Okay, so next up is, does the escrow or PBA create a trust? Now, Obviously, uh, a trust is important in the event of an insolvency, because if a trust has been created in favor of the contractor, then the contractor can call on the payments despite the insolvency itself. If no trust is created, then the contractor is an unsecured creditor and must prove their losses in the insolvency procedure in the same way all other creditors uh, must do in the insolvency process. Um, it is not always obvious that a trust has been created also, and it's a very important aspect of escrow accounts and project bank accounts. Uh, so how do you decide, <clears throat> how, do you, how do you distinguish if a trust, if, if, um, if your escrow or project bank account is a trust or not? Well, basically there are two steps to establish this. Uh, so you've got to look at the terms of the contract. So you start with the escrow or project bank account stating that a trust um, as being created um, as beneficial. And then you have to review how the account operates. Um, and key point is if the insolvent company mixes its own funds with trust funds, that can cause the trust to fail, which was the case in Moriarty versus uh, various customers of, of BA Peters PLC. So, John, so that's, I mean, that's a very important point because a, a trust will not be created if the, um, if the employer is basically treating the escrow or project bank account as any other regular bank account. And from a contractor's point of view, you will want to ensure that uh, the trust funds are clear and, and, and they're separate to other funds of the employer. And, Basically, it's clear that that money is intended for the contractor in order in order to provide the payment security it needs to to complete the contract. Essentially, so very key points to consider uh, when you are looking at uh, PB uh, project bank accounts or escrow accounts as well. That trust test, and you'd, you'd want to it, it would want to say it in the terms of the escrow or project bank account as well. Um, as to whether a trust has or not has been created or not. Final point is that jointly controlled accounts reduce this, and the contractor needs to consider the point uh, when setting up the escrow PBA. Say the exact same as what I've been saying. Um, you know, you just you want to have that. You want to have the bank account secured. You want to have um, no money mixing with the uh, minimum level or the escrow amounts, uh, depending on whatever the agreement is. Uh, because if it is, then the trust will not be created and you won't have any security because the contract, the employer can still uh, become insolvent um, and you won't have any entitlement to that money in the account. Basically, that will go back to the insolvency practitioner and uh, the contractor will have to complete his application uh, to, the, to, the insol to the IP in the same way as everybody else. If you can avoid that as a contractor, you 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 always should, um, because that's where the real security and the real benefit of a, of a PBA or an escrow account kicks in. Okay, next up. Uh, so guarantee from the employer's uh, parents. So this is like almost like a reverse parent company guarantee. So uh, this, this may be, uh, may be provided where a new subsidiary commences work and wishes to build up their own business or similar circumstances. So um, yeah, where there's a subsidiary, new subsidiary, they want to start building up their own trading history. They're a new division of the parent. Um, 
you know, to get them up and running. Um, it's often the case that the employer uh, will act as, um, or the, the parent will act as the guarantor uh, of the subsidiary in order to give the uh, contractors that the subsidiary engages with the comfort that they're actually going to be paid. Um, final point is that it's usually a secondary obligation only and the liability depends on, the, on breach of the subsidiary. Um, so look, it, they're quite, they do, they're quite unusual, but they, but they do happen. Um, and they are obviously dependent um, on the employer's willingness to, um, you know, to provide it. And also as well is that the employer will generally have the upper hand in the negotiations. Uh, hence my final point is that um, it's usually a secondary obligation only, and it will only uh, kick in in the event that, um, uh, that the new subsidiary has failed to make any payments, essentially. So, look, it does happen. Um, it's it's unusual, but it's <clears throat> it is an option available, and that's um, and it should always be considered if you are dealing with any new subsidiary company, particularly where there is a parent, and obviously, even better where there is a strong parent. <clears throat> okay, so current trends. Um, so no one size fits all solution. As you can see, there's so I, I've mentioned quite a few different, um, you know, circumstance, cer different circumstances there. I mean, it all it all depends. I mean, you got to understand what these what these mechanisms do, and just apply it to the facts then, and whatever your particular situation is. Uh, the background circumstances are key, as I said. Uh, one interesting development that is going on at the moment. <clears throat> Uh, excuse me, is uh, potential developments in the use of blockchain technology. Um, these are currently being considered in detail. Um, there, I mean, they are some time away, but uh, the premise is that a uh, blockchain technology uh, through its use, I mean, potentially in time where it can be um, used alongside the likes of BIM to estimate a, you know, project completion and as a result, a you know generate estimated um, uh, payments as well to to various contractors that can be locked in at the beginning of the project, and um, you know that can also be that can also be considered as um, as a security for payment mechanism, uh, you know later later on in time. I mean, look, we're some time away from it, but um, it is a it's an area where uh, technology is obviously catching up um, uh, with with the industry. And also dealing with the, you know, with problems at the industry because, you know, there, there's no getting away from it. I mean, you know, secure payment is absolutely crucial um, to to a supply chain and a and a properly functioning uh, construction industry. And if the, if technology can be implemented to uh, support that, then absolutely that should be encouraged. Um, so yeah, so look, that that brings us to the end of payment security. Uh, we're going to move on to. Uh, to performance security now, and as I said earlier, um, these are va various forms of security given by the uh, given by the contractor to the employer. And so the main items we're going to discuss are uh, are bonds and uh, parent company guarantees. Okay, so bonds. So what are they? I mean, look, we're very familiar with them, but <clears throat> so what they are is an obligation to an obligation a third party as guarantor to pay money on a defined event, which is usually the contractor's insolvency. Um, it may also be termination if the contractor has completely failed in his obligation to perform, in his obligation to proceed regularly and, di and diligently with the works. Um, and such events, the events should be covered and, um, and described, uh, or can just say a breach, and, and breach obviously, um, you know, will extend to termination. You may want to in include for the avoidance of doubt that it relates to insolvency also. Uh, the difference between on demand and performance bonds, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, was explained in detail in the case of Uanda versus Multiplex, uh, which, is, which is quite a recent case. So on demand bonds. So on demand bonds are known as uh, uncon unconditional bonds. Uh, the primary obligation is on the bondsman to pay once the notice is issued by the employer in line with the term with the bond terms. Uh, there is no need for the employer to prove a breach when dealing with an on-demand bond. That's seen as the biggest risk with on-demand bonds because um, 
uh, the employer can act vexatiously. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the employer can act vexatiously and basically potentially even fraudulently in calling on the bond, which is obviously going to put the contractor in a in a fairly precarious position. Um, On-demand bonds are now, they're very difficult to obtain. Most bondsmen will require the bond amount to be paid as a deposit. So effectively, a bondsman, in order to protect himself from the risk of an on-demand bond, will actually want the full amount of the on-demand bond from the contractor as security for, for providing the bond. Um, so you can see the, you know, um, the impact that that can have on a, on a contractor um, in order to come up with that money at, at the front end, as well as trying to you know, fund the works and deal with work in progress as well. <clears throat> so it is, it, it's quite an onerous position. And, and again, that's one of the reasons why there has been, um, why there on, on demand is, is, uh, you know, is very rare in industry um, anymore. Um, so final point is that the pro there is a problem with on demand bonds, which, which does include fraud as was the case in Dusan Babcock versus uh, Commercial Isadora de Equipos. It was actually over, it was a case over in Brazil um, when the employer refused to take over the building. Now in that case, the employer refused to take over the building. He was, act, he was acting vexatiously because he wanted to deny the contractor practical completion. Um, and as a result of what he alleged to be the late completion, he was entitled to the on-demand bond. And it, Basically, the case highlighted the issue with on-demand bonds is that, um, you know, lack of honesty. Uh, the, you know, the, the employer there was acting dishonestly and trying to, uh, I guess, uh, realize a benefit from the on-demand bond that it really shouldn't, that it really had no entitlement to. So, um, yeah, hence the reason why you can see the issues that they create and the reason why they're. Uh, you know they're they're quite rare. They're they're very rare in industry. I mean, I can't. I I I've never. I've actually never dealt with an on-demand bond because of the onerous uh, obligations as we as we looked at above. Performance bond now, obviously, performance bond is a far more popular means uh, of uh, performance security, and performance bond usually uh, for ten percent of the contract sum. So that's the bond amount in the in the bond itself. <clears throat> Uh, this amount becomes payable by the bondsman upon a breach being committed by the contractor. Now, again, the, the breaches need to be listed in the in the bond itself, um, but obviously it also relies upon the terms of the contract also. So the intention of the performance bond is to underwrite the performance of the contractor, and in the event of insolvency, then the employer can call on the bond amount to assist with engaging another contractor, delay costs, and the like. Um, so basically, the you know the bond amount is intended um, as a, almost like a remedy for the um, as a, like a remedy for the for the employer in the event of of non-performance. Um, that money can be used to engage a new contractor um, to LA you know costs as a result of the no delayed completion because um, of the time involved in ter terminating the the. Um, uh, the insolvent contractor's contract, but then the process of engaging a new a new contractor, which is not all as straightforward because you know you can be in a position where you have a half bit half built project, and um, it can be very difficult to uh, it, engage another contractor, and it and it does take time. So that really the bond is is there as a remedy to you know for the employer to contribute against you know additional interest costs that he may have on a loan to finance the work. Um, etc. So that's really what the bond amount is intended for. Um, the bondsman would require a deed of indemnity from the contractor, um, and that's basically so that's a, a, a an agreement that sits under the you know the performance bond because um, that indemnity will basically say if the contractor you know doesn't you know acts dishonestly or doesn't perform the contract. Um, th you know, in, in a proper and work-like manner, or basically they don't take their contractual obligation seriously, well, then the bondsman is not going to be, you know, the bondsman wants recourse to the contractor um, to recover the bond amount um, 
if if that's how the contractor behaves and 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 he'll do that through the um through the deed of indemnity itself um so it's important to be aware of that um that deed and and what happens in the event that uh the contractor just completely fails in their obligations i mean yeah as i said the 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 bondsman isn't going to be too happy to be picking up the liability whilst the contractor moves on to another project and it's the, the bondsman deal with the mess um the most common form of uh bond performance bond is the association of uh, british of, of british insurers uh, uh type bond basically um it's you know that's the industry standard. The one you know the one thing is that um, uh, it doesn't deal with insolvency. So it, it basically there for you know for termination. But obviously termination can you know uh, the insolvency can be treated as a termination itself uh, event in, uh, in its own right as well. So again, you know these documents do depend on the wording and whatever is agreed between the parties. Um, so can a performance. <coughs> bond be considered to be on demand. Um, watch out for clauses that state the bond is payable upon the decision of an adjudicator or arbitrator or other uh, third party. <clears throat> Cause bo because bondsmen are considering such a clause to be akin to an on-demand obligation. Uh, this is because the bondsman may not have the right to challenge the adjudicator's decision before having to pay out the bond amount. Um, of course, the, you know, the, um, the bondsman can challenge the decision in litigation later on, but all the while the employer has been paved uh, under the adjudicated decision, and it's basically the bondsman that is left on the hook. So that's an important um, point to make because uh, the bondsman will, you know, vary his rate accordingly if the bond can be called upon or can be decided by an, an adjudicator or arbitrator. Um, <clears throat> Because that obviously increases the risk profile of the bond for the bondsman, and like this can mean this can basically have the effect that the bond is twice as expensive as say a normal uh, a normal ABI worded bond. So you you need to be aware of the I guess the commercial impact that such a clause makes, and 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 also the logic behind uh, behind it and why uh, the bondsman see you know. Considered, considered this now to be akin to an on-demand. Um, I understand why bondsmen do it. Uh, I always try, you know, and, and have it removed because, you know, bonds are expensive enough without doubling the price. Because you want, <coughs> excuse me, because you want the adjudicator an adjudicator to be allowed to make the call on it. Um, it's a it's a commercial reality. If you're pricing projects, um, you got to be aware of the impact that. Um, that final decision on the bond by a third party can have uh, on the cost of the bond, which, you know, we, we know, I mean, it is borne by the employer, but um, I mean, if he can say, if he can get the, get the same bond, but at half the price that, you know, without, and it doesn't include the clause saying an adjudicator can decide it, you know, I think that he, he should be aware of that. And then, um, and be able to make an informed decision. So it's a very important clause to um, to be aware of, uh, you know, legally and commercially. You know, this is a, you know, this it, it's they're both treated as equal in in these circumstances because legally you understand the reason why um, the employer might insist on the clause, but commercially you've got to understand the reason why um, why it increases the risk profile for the bondsman. And as a result, it makes it more expensive. Um, and, the, you know, he just wants to make an informed decision as to whether it's worth the risk or not. So that's one, that's a key point I wanted to make on performance bonds. You, you see these clauses, <clears throat> they're coming up um, a lot more, uh, they're a lot more common now uh, where they want the third party to make, to be allowed to decide on whether the bond can be called or not. Um, but just be aware that bondsmen don't like it, and they will, and they will, as I said, increase the cost of the bond, of the bonds um, accordingly. Okay, so what are common types of bonds? So retention bond, uh, we discussed retention in a, in a seminar a couple of weeks ago. Um, so it is an, an, an alternative to normal retention. Um, 
basically where a bond is provided in, in lieu of retention, uh, that can be, you know, it's got to be agreed between the parties up front. The cost is borne by the contractor, but the benefit for the contractor is that he has no retention deducted from his um, interim payments, uh, which obviously is his cash flow. So you'll have, you'll have a cost up front, but um, over the course of the project, that will, uh, it will, it will basically pay, pay him back uh, through the retention bond mechanism and through the not having retention deducted from his interim payments. Bid bond, so this is for contractors on large projects where they want to have a bond. Uh, they, they're obviously going to ex, uh, spend significant sums in tendering a large project, usually large infrastructure projects. And basically the bond will pay out in the event that he's unsuccessful and is unable to recover uh, the costs he's spent in preparing that bid uh, through, the uh, through the completion of the work. So that's a bid bond. Uh, advance payment bond, again, protects the employers uh, and uh, protects the employer's advance payment in the event of a contractor insolvency. Um, so you can get an advance payment bond. Um, also, this links back to the earlier advance, uh, advance payment that we were discussing in the, um, in the payment security. Uh, part in, in section one, so yeah, you can you can get a you can get a bond for that again. Um, depends on the size of the bond. It depends on the size of the advance payment also, and uh, and just may, having a commercially sensible bond to protect his risk if that's what he wants. Okay, so moving on. So we're going to look at parent company guarantees. So uh, very familiar in industry, very common uh, parent company guarantees. Uh, so basically, the, this where the parent does what it says in the tin basically parent guarantees performance of his subs of the subsidiary and um, if the subsidiary defaults the parent becomes liable you know that's essentially what the you know parent company guarantee is and what a parent company guarantee was always intended to be and um, as pure guarantee the parent's liability should only be uh, invoked in the event of default now that's a really important point because what we're seeing now is that most parent company guarantees are drafted as indemnities rather than um, guarantees themselves. And it's a really important uh, distinction between um, a guarantee and an indemnity, uh, which I've kind of summarized here. But basically the crux of it is that a guarantee, it, guarantee basically is, is a secondary liability and the parent company guarantee can only be called upon in the event of a breach. Um, Whereas an indemnity is a primary liability. And if you're looking at an a parent company guarantee that is really an indemnity, uh, you'll see terms such as primary obligor and the guarantor can be called upon uh, basically without any breach of the underlying contract. Um, so it's a primary liability that's being um, imposed on the, uh, on the parent in those circumstances, um, which, is, which is quite significant. Which is, which is significant because the um, basically the the employer just say if, if the employer uh, has a parent company guarantee basically means that the employer can engage the um, <clears throat> uh, excuse me can engage the employ can engage the parent without the subsidiary being in breach now that might not I mean that might not sound significant um, and and in reality it might not make a, a, a huge difference to uh, to the general um, the general position, but if it's an indemnity, basically it means that um, the you know that the employer will be entitled to you know indemnity means payment on a pound for pound basis, and and gener and it will restrict the the rights of the um, of the parent or the subsidiary to uh, you know to defend its position against uh, against the employer. So do be aware of that, just the significant difference between um, a guarantee and indemnity. It is, it's really, uh, really important. And especially within the realm of, um, of parent company guarantees. I mean, the parent company guarantees now are, you know, most of them are, they're not guarantees, they're actually indemnities, um, which, does, which does significantly change the risk matrix uh, for the parent and the subsidiary. So just a point to be aware of there. <clears throat> um, 
Yeah, so basically that's kind of summed up all the other, all the other points and that's um, on that slide and that's the real that's the real key takeaway if you want to take away anything uh, from you know, you know from this that is that is a really important point to be aware of uh, when you are dealing with your with your parent company guarantees they're more like parent company um, indemnities rather than guarantees. Okay, so um we're coming to the end now, so I'm saying that uh, don't forget section 113 of um, of the Housing Grants Act, um, because section 113 is a prohibition of conditional payment provisions, um, which is a provision making payment under a construction contract conditional on the payer receiving payment from a third party is ineffective unless that third person or other person pay or any other uh, person payment by whom is under the contract directly or indirectly, a condition of payment by that third person is insolvent. So um, employer insolvency can impact on the supply chain um, ability to be paid. Now, section 113 is really important because it basically, the Housing Grants Act did outlaw pay when paid mechanisms, but there is an exception to that. And the exception is this section 113 because uh, pay when paid actually does kick in where there has been an upstream insolvency. So if the employer um, has become insolvent, then uh, the contractors, just say if, for, so if you're a subcontractor, um, the subcontractor's ability to be paid is then completely restricted to, some, to only those sums which the contractor has been paid by the employer. And, you know, it's often the case that where an employer does become insolvent, you know, there will already have been late payments or non-payment upstream between the employer and, and the between the employer and the contractor also. I mean, it's very rare that an employer would be, you know, fully uh, meeting his payment obligations um, upstream and then all of a sudden become insolvent. Uh, that's generally not, not how it works. I mean, there will have been non-payment and, and, and the, that's that's a real important um, a security I, um, clause to be aware of is that um, if you are if you are a subcontractor and you're carrying out your own due diligence, I ought to say to subcontractors that um, you know it's, you have to check out the creditworthiness of the employer. Now, in in most circumstances, obviously the contractor will have had the same uh, conversation with the employer in order to satisfy themselves that the employer has the ability to pay. But the subcontractor needs to be aware that um, he can't, you know, he, he can't just keep, he does, if he keeps quiet and doesn't raise the issue, um, well, then he is, he is at risk because um, if that employer does become uh, insolvent, then the subcontractor's ability to be repaid is completely hampered and restricted to those sums that have only been paid by the employer uh, to the contractor. So it's a very important point for subcontractors. Look, it's, it's obviously an important point for main contractors also, but um, th at least the main contractor is, is in that contractual relationship with the employer that uh, he can have the conversation, carry out his own due diligence, um, get his escrow account, project bank account, um, you know what, whatever he needs in order to um, in order to make sure that he's confident that the empl employer has the ability to pay. But subcontractors are are a step down from the main contractor, um, and albeit the subcontract is a creature of the main contract, it um, section one one three will kick in in the event um, of the employer's insolvency. So. Very important point to bear in mind for any subcontractors carrying out their due diligence, uh, and it's really important as well around the you know the whole topic of security because um, there's no point you know there is an exception to the pay when paid obligation, and that is the event of insolvency. So yeah, just just be aware of that as well. Okay, so what's the right solution? So payment security. So. If you're looking for pay, if the contractor is looking for payment security, they must consider, um, you know, where is the where is the employer domiciled? So are they based in the UK or overseas? Um, obviously, overseas companies can pose a, a more significant risk because 
um, you may not have a, a, a trail of or, or trading history for them in the UK, which does help when analysing the risk of an employer uh, up front. Uh, so yeah, as I said, payment history is important. Are they a special purpose vehicle uh, set up to, purely to deliver that one-off project? Again, that poses a, a higher risk to main contractors, subcontractors, because basically most SPVs are there to deliver the project. <coughs> uh, excuse me. And, um, and once the project is complete, then the SPV disappears, which obviously poses a risk um, for retention, especially. excuse me, <clears throat> for retention um, and final payments uh, that may be made to the main contractor. So that's really important to bear in mind. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, trading history also. So you'll have company's house, you'll have credit safe checks, and these are the normal due diligence items that need to be uh, checked up, checked at the outset. Um, performance security. So what does the employer have to consider? So you should consider the contractors so their balance sheet, um, are they strong? Do they have significant funds? Do they have significant shareholder funds? What is their cash position as well? Um, that's basically a review of their accounts. Um, do they have experience of similar projects? Uh, can, they perform, can, they, can they provide a performance bond? Because um, like I said earlier, they have to, um, uh, they're going to have to put some money down to, pro to provide a performance bond. And, Obviously, a bondsman is only going to provide it if he's satisfied um, as to the credit worthiness of the contractor. So, yeah, very important to consider. Uh, they're, if, they're, if they're able to get a performance bond, then, you know, by and large, that's, uh, that should, the, the employer should be able to take a significant, um, uh, say, you know, confidence from, from, the, from their ability to do that. Also, are they part of a group? And if they are, um, you know, you can also look at the parent company guarantees, uh, which we've just discussed earlier. So, yeah, I mean, look, again, like I said earlier, it all depends on the facts, the circumstances, the bargaining position of the parties comes into it as well. Uh, what you're able to obtain, what's, you know, what and, and come up with, in order to come up with the right solution, a uh, security solution for that particular project. Um, so that's it, guys. Uh, you know, thanks for thanks for bearing with me on that. Uh, we covered payment payment security, performance security, and yeah, ha happy to take any questions that you may have now. Okay, thank you. And yeah, that's good because there are quite a few questions, Mr. Rohan. Um, someone's right, asking, <laughs> can a PBA be used under a JCT DMB if the employer has separate contracts with the supply chain? Uh, can it be? Yeah, I mean, there's. It, it needs to be agreed separately, Julie. But um, but yeah, it can be. Um, you know, a PBA can be introduced if the uh, you know, into into pretty into into more circumstances. It'll, but it will all depend on the wording of the PBA and the and the and the contract itself as well. Um. So yeah. So it look depends. You know. But there's no reason why a PBA couldn't be, you know, can't be used in 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 um, in such circumstances. Okay. Okay. Someone else is asking, what is an SPV? I know we use acronyms all the time. Can't forget that. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> yeah. <Always. clears throat> Sorry. Yeah. SPV is um SPV is a special purpose vehicle. Um. So, special purpose vehicle is basically what we know as. Um, a new company that's been created uh, in order to deliver a project. So, right. um, and basically, they're one off, they're one off uh, you know, new code that are set up to deliver, yeah, one off projects. Um, and what it does, I mean, most, a lot of developers use SPVs as a vehicle because um, it protects their overall group as well. It's, it's largely there to, mit to mitigate, to minimize potential um, damage to an employer, especially if they have a group, because if one development goes wrong, they don't want that development to have the ability to take down the, the empire, as it were, um, that the employer may have built up. So that's the reason why SPVs are, are used by and large, um, and they're very common here on, on development projects in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. 
and that's and that's essentially what an SPV is and and why they're used. Okay. Okay. Next question up is: Does early payment impact <clears throat> retention? Um. Does early payment impact retention? I mean. You can deduct retention from the early payment. Um, again, it, it does. Need, it just needs to be agreed. <clears throat> um, I, I think it's important for the parties to consider, you know, the uh, the early payment in, the, you know, and the purpose. Like I was saying earlier, um, you know, what is the purpose of the of the early of the early payment? I mean, I, I don't. It doesn't make a lot of sense to. I mean, because on one hand you're giving the early payment, but then you know almost immediately you're taking some of it back through the through the retention mechanism. Um, but there's no reason why you can't deduct retention from it. But it, it's kind of doing you know you're giving it one hand and taking back with the other straight away. Um, okay. But the I think the the retention grounds around it uh, should be agreed. I mean, especially. You know, if you're agreeing, uh, if there's a letter or some agreement to say what the purpose of it is within that, I mean, I think it should be saying that uh, no retention will be deducted, but, you know, retention on the, on the rest of the works, uh, no retention be reducted, or, sorry, will be uh, deducted um, once the advance payment is paid, but obviously it can be clawed back through the retention mechanism that will operate throughout the remainder of the contract. Um, it should just deal, deal with that in the agreement. Or, or whatever uh, way the early payments um, is documented and agreed, okay? Okay. Someone else is asking, what about the interest generated in the escrow account? <clears throat> yeah, uh, good question. Um, generally, that will be catered for within the escrow agreement itself. And I mean, as the money essentially in the escrow account is the employer's money, um, generally, the escrow accounts do say that any interest generated um, is the employer's. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. if the if the contractor is entitled to interest on any late payments um, under the contract, so you know it may well be the case that if the escrow account, if the employer, if the employer fails to make a payment, and the contractor has to call on the escrow account, then the escrow account can be used to pay. The, uh, say any unpaid valuations by the employer plus the retention um, that so, sorry plus the interest that the contractor may be entitled to on delayed payments. Um, but generally the interest on the amount in the escrow account um, because it's the employer's money it generally follows that the interest is uh, is the property of the employers also. Okay. Yeah. Um, next question. Question: Is there a significant cost in setting up an escrow account and administration? Uh, the person concerned is, is saying they're about to start a project for a client with no trading history and thinking of proposing it. The project is circa 250k value. Right. Um, yeah. Is there a significant cost? I mean, it, you need an agreement. I mean, it, but it doesn't have to be. Um, it doesn't have to be over, you know, overly complicated. I mean, you know, the essence of it is that it gives you the security to perform, and that the release mechanism is clear, also. So, I mean, on, on a on a simple, on a straightforward project like that, it can be, it can be relatively straightforward. I mean, obviously, a 250k value project is different to a hundred million type infrastructure project, which you know, escrow accounts are frequently used, but. But no, look, there's no reason why on, on a straightforward project that you can't keep the escrow account, um, you know, relatively straightforward also um, as a means to, you know, yeah, get, get the security that you're looking for on, on, your, on your project, okay? Um, next question. How is a performance bond usually triggered? Do you need to have specific criteria in the contract that needs to be met for a client to claim the bond value? Yeah, that's um, yeah, good question. So, I mean, the performance bond will generally be clear, and and I mean, the most uh, the most common you know event is is any contractor's uh, default or breach under 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 the contract. That's when a performance bond is triggered. Now, you may need to define you you can define what that trigger event is, um, which will include acts of insolvency, termination of contracts. Um, 
or you, I mean, you can take it to whatever level you want to um, to to define uh, what the trigger event is. Um, and obviously, you will have to meet a specific criteria um, in the bond rather than the contract in order to in order for the client to be able to make a call on the performance bond. You know, because that's what the bond. You know, because you got to think about it. The third party, the bondsman. You know, he's he's only really concerned about the bond, and ultimately, you're asking him to pay uh, the bond amount. So it's really to focus on the trigger events under the bond uh, rather than the rather than the contract itself. Um, and once you can do that, then uh, you generally, you know, you generally have a, you know, have a right to, you know, obviously upon triggering one of those events, you know, generally that means that the that the bond gets paid out. I mean, you're obviously going to, you may meet res some resistance from the bondsman because he's not going to be too happy about paying out. <laughs> But you will have to deal with that in the, you know, in, in the normal dialogue with a bondsman in order to, in order to get what you believe you're entitled to. Okay. Yeah. No one's ever happy to write out a large check, are they? Not really. No. Not, not, not in our experience, Julie. Really, huh? Um, how would a bond <laughs> premium be calculated generally? Um. So you, basically, um, if you have a project, take an example, a project uh, for a million pounds. The performance bond is for 10% of the a contract sum. And if the contract sum is a million pounds, the um, a, the performance bond is for a hundred thousand pounds as 10% of the contract sum. Now, general rule of thumb is that the bond, a, the bondsman will apply a rate a, to the hundred thousand pounds, which in my experience, can be between a uh, you know two to three percent, um, and he would basically multiply that then for the duration uh, for which the bond is, and the bond can eat, so and and the, the most important point there is when does the bond expire? Does it expire on the contractor's practical completion, or does it expire on the contractor's making good of defects, or some other some other point? into the distant future. However long the bond is, um, the, bo the bondsman will price it on the basis of, uh, of, however, of how long he's going to be on risk, essentially. It's almost like mm. an insurance policy. You know, the longer he's yeah. on risk, the longer he's on risk, the more he's going to charge you. Um, it's like, you know, it's the same as, um, you know, your car insurance. Obviously, um, if it's, a, so you got to be aware of, um, of how long the how long the bond is intended to be in place for, uh, so and usually it's it is that two three percent. But bear in mind what I was saying earlier about the performance bond with the, uh, you know the, how the bondsmen are treating, um, uh, clauses which allow an adjudicator to make a call on the bond, and um, that's you know that can significantly affect and and it can it can sometimes double the premium that a bondsman would 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 ask for. Um, in order to provide the performance bond. So look, that's a general calculation. I mean, that's how I used to do them um, as a QS. That's how I used to price them. And, and uh, that's, that's how bondsmen price them as well. There's no, there's no secret to it. Um, and that's generally how it operates, OK? OK, a um, couple more <coughs> questions. As a main contractor, how wary of S113 of the Act should we be? And how do we mitigate the risk? Uh, they're saying, they guess, that advanced payment provisions would be one way or could be one way. Yeah. Um, look, as a main contractor, you need to be very wary of Section 113. But I mean, it, it kind of goes without saying anyway. Um, I was kind of focusing section 103 on the subcontractors because <clears throat> that upstream insolvency has a significant effect on subcontractors, which from experience, a lot of subcontractors are actually unaware of, you know, um, <clears throat> because, you know, there is this perception and it is true that, the, you know, pay when paid is outlawed, but it, there is that exception created under section 113 is significant. Um, how do you mitigate the risk? Well, basically by looking at any of those um, payment security options that we looked at earlier. So it could be advanced payment, as you said there, um, escrow account, project bank account, employers, parent company guarantee if the, if, the, if the employer has a parent 
uh, you can look at that also. And um, one other option, I guess, is um, uh, that I didn't discuss is, um, <clears throat> is uh, credit risk insurance. So you can actually um, obtain credit risk insurance uh, that will pay out in the event of, um, of, a, of an employer's insolvency also. Um, so that's another option that can be considered, but like, you know, main contractors need to be, obviously, main contractors need to be asking themselves, how, you know, how, how are we going to get paid? I mean, that should be the, the, the first question that you'd be asking yourself when an employer is asking you to price for work or, or you're close to agreeing a contract. Um, because as I said earlier, you know, the essence is your main contractor, you want to build something and the, and the employer wants that bill, but obviously he's going to have to pay for it. And the main contractor wants to be paid. That's, that's the reason why he's entering into the contract. Um, and you have to be aware of it absolutely upfront and enter into contract on the terms that, that you're comfortable with. Because if you don't ask these questions upfront, unfortunately, you're not going to be in a good position if the, if the employer does become insolvent um, and you're left to pick up the pieces later on. So yeah, yeah the, look, the, to answer the question, you have to be very wary of section 113 as a main contractor and a subcontractor, okay? Right. <clears throat> okay, um, when you are paying for significant materials on site, what additional protection can be secured for the contractor to ensure that the materials are the property of the employer and that payments have been made to the supplier or subcontractor, subcontractor down the chain? Is it sufficient to rely on the terms of the JCT contract regarding title passing on payment? This is especially where there is a delay between material delivery and installation on site. So it's sitting there for some mm. while. Okay, yeah. Um, basically, if you're paying for materials on site, um, what, like generally one way to uh, you know protect the risk rather than you know, I don't think you should just, I mean, obviously depending on the value of those materials, <clears throat> you know, if we're talking about, you know, a set of windows for five grand, um, I don't think, you know, you, you may rely on, on the JCT, but if you're relying on, you know, a structural steel frame that's been, that's offside that you're paying for, that's worth a million pounds. I mean, I think in those circumstances, you'd, you'd, you'd always want what's known as a vesting certificate. And that vesting certificate basically, um, you know, deals with the fact that payment has been made um, by the, in this case, main contractor to the subcontractor or supplier for those materials. And as a result, the title on those materials passes to the main contractor. Um, because you, you want that because in the event of, just say that subcontractor uh, becomes insolvent, the, employee, the main contractor will want to be able to claim the, the materials as his because they have been paid for. <clears throat> I mean, and this is especially true as, uh, where there is a delay between the material delivery and the installation. I mean, from a, a supplier, a subcontractor point of view, if the, if the delay is, is through no fault of their own, they may be looking at some storage costs that they'd want to recover from the main contractor as a result because obviously you agreed a date for delivery and if that date for delivery gets pushed back, it continues to take up space and there is a cost associated with that uh, by and large. Um, so I think, it, it, uh, you know, again, it doesn't surprise anyone to hear a sister saying uh, it depends on the circumstances, but um, I think, you know, if the, if the value of the materials offsite is significant, always uh, consider the use of a vesting cert. Um, it's the best, you know, it's the best formal way to protect yourself because it will, it will identify the materials as the property of the main contractor um, and which will, be, which will be invaluable for a main contractor afterwards when dealing with an insolvency practitioner and they're trying to claim title and ownership of those materials, which the insolvency practitioner will be trying to claim as, as general goods that he can dispose of in order to pay the, the other creditors. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it depends on the value, but I'd be, I'd be going for a vesting certificate as much as possible. I think that's the best way to protect yourself uh, when you're dealing with materials on, uh, on site, okay? Okay. Um, 
two questions left. What is the general yeah. percentage of a contract sum allowed for in an escrow account? Um, I'm not sure there's a general. I'm not sure there's a general rule. I, 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 my experience is that it depends on uh, projected cash flow, um, and you, to calculate that, you'd want to look at um, the work in progress from the contractor. Um, look at the payment terms and then look at how long it's going to take for the contractor to um, call on the funds in the escrow account on, under the escrow agreement. Um, usually you'd want to be you'd want to be considering about you know I'd say four to five months work in progress um, from a contractor's point of view which must be based upon his you know his projected cash flow obviously. Um, I think as a general rule of thumb, you can you can really apply a general percentage. It does depend on, uh, you know, on, on on the cash flow and also looking at what's the potent, what's the maximum, what's the longest duration of exposure that I could have on this project uh, without getting paid. And I think generally from experience, that's usually uh, four to five months. Obviously, try and get from a contractor's point of view. You want that escrow sum. I mean, ideally, you'd want that escrow sum to be the entire contract sum, um, and that's you know, as a starting position, a contractor should go for that. But it's not always, it's not always practical to do it that way. Um, so I think you know, from you know, from experience, it's it's generally worked out to be four to five months of um, of cash flow for the contractor. Okay. Okay. And the final question for today. Um, someone here is saying they've dealt with contract guarantee bonds where the wording says the guarantor will be released on faithful performance by the contractor. In that specific case, they had to get the arbitrator to include those words in his award. OK, I mean, I'm not sure this is a question. I mean, it's an interesting um, it's an interesting point And thanks for and thanks for providing it. I mean, I'm not sure even the jurisdiction that that uh, that 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 was. We, I mean, faithful performance. Uh, faithful performance can mean a lot of things. Um, a bit like, uh, you know, it's almost like it, it's almost akin to a duty of good faith, you know. Um, and 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 look, I mean, you know, the words in contract in the in these in bonds can can say a lot of things. I mean, obviously, again, it depends on. On the wording and the agreement but that look that's an interesting turn of phrase and it's interesting also that you had to get the arbitrator to include it in his award because i'd imagine otherwise the bondsman so that was at the insistence of the bondsman so um yeah it's you know and i can see you know it's it i can see why a bondsman would want that and you can also see all, you know the challenges that bondsmen present when a bond is being called upon. Like you said, Julie, nobody likes writing out a big a big check, especially if it can be avoided. And it gives you, it's a good insight into, you know, the challenges you face, even though you have a performance bond in place, uh, the challenges you face when trying, you know, when, tr when trying to call upon it. Mm. Uh, but no, look, but thanks for sharing that, Fergus. That's an interesting point. OK, that's uh, that's the questions done for today. As always, if you have anything, as I've said earlier, that you didn't particularly want to ask in um, an open forum, please feel free to email Connor. That's connorahern at silverllp.com. Certificates will be sent out uh, later today and first thing tomorrow, along with the link to the recording of the seminar. Someone had asked about that. Uh, next up is next week, we have three seminars. We have Wednesday morning which is leave site now, don't come back. Uh, Wednesday, Wednesday evening is Construction Essentials, which is with Richard Silver, and he's talking about programming and planning. And then on Thursday, we have uh, the latest in the Adjudication Matters series with Mohammed Hack, and that's evidencing a claim. If anyone would like uh, a place on any of those, please email seminars at silverllp.com. Otherwise, it just remains me for me to thank you very much, Connor. Uh, you've answered a lot of questions there. Really interesting presentation. So thank you. And uh, no say thank you to everyone else. And have a great day, everyone. We'll see you all again soon. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.